Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Geek Minded Fools. My name's Graham. And I'm Scott. As usual, we'll kick off with another visit to the monkey farm. Yee-haw! Hey partners, it's time to see what Scott's doing down on his monkey farm. Oh sir, this is an exciting time. It certainly is. A very exciting time. Just being with you, I'm excited. <laughs> Literally, just, just Lord, being near Lord you. Lord love you for that. Just being near you excites me. There's some really, really, really important things we need to talk about today. I've got some very exciting sequel news. I've got some very exciting Batman v Superman news. Uh-huh. And I've also got another bit of news which is going to tie back to the first bit of news we're going to talk about. Oh, okay. Now, obviously, you heard me say at the top there, we've got some very exciting sequel news. So, obviously, the most important thing that is coming to us this year... Paul Blart, Mall Cop 2. <laughs> I know, I know you're... Ex- I can barely contain my <sighs> excitement. Can't read my own writing. Sorry, sorry. The Star Wars trailer's here! Yay! And it, it single-handedly created world peace, it, it seems. <laughs> it, it, it literally did. I mean, every, every single bit. It, it made the news. It was all over the news. Obviously, it made the news, but it was all over the news, and people were crying. Fanboys were... across the globe spontaneously ejaculate. And rightly so. Yep. You've obviously seen it. I know you've seen it, because you phoned me directly after I'd seen it, and <laughs> yes. I was going... And I, I answered the phone to you to say, are you phoning me because you've seen it? And you weren't. You weren't phoning no. me because you'd seen the trailer, because you hadn't seen it, I no, don't think, at the no, time. at that point, I hadn't seen it. Uh, but you then did watch it, and you came back to me, um, and you were as excited as I was. Absolutely, yes. Now, I think it's fair to say that this trailer better captures the whole Star Wars universe and the atmosphere and just the vibe. Yeah, obviously, this is teaser trailer number two, and there's far more in it, but I think this one, they've obviously gone for the existing cast yeah. uh, push, yeah. and therefore you've got the voiceover from Luke echoing his um, speech to Leia in Return of the Jedi, yeah. but introducing, obviously, the concept of a next generation. Yeah. But, obviously, we only saw brief glimpses of those. We saw Luke's robotic hand. We saw... We did. He was he's giving uh, R2 a little bit of a, a temple massage, it Absolutely. looks like. Absolutely. We saw Leia... Handing over a lightsaber, either handing or over or being handed receiving, to receiving, yeah. right, either giving or receiving. Hey, we, uh, Gary Fisher's up for either, I would imagine. But then, of course, you know the big, the big money shots right at the end. But we'll come to that in a bit. But uh, obviously, in terms of screen time, lots of new Imperial. I don't know whether we call it that, but new bad guy costumes. But Do you know, have, they've, I think they've actually changed their names now. They're not called the the Empire anymore. Yeah, but, I would think so because of course an empire is led by an emperor. Yeah, and the emperor is very much deed. Yes, very dead. Very, very dead. Yes, um, but obviously a huge amount of screen time for your friend and mine. John Boyega from Attack the Block. John Boyega from Attack the Block, who I absolutely adore. And uh, do you know what? I was right when I thought he was going to go on to bigger things, wasn't I? Mm. Mm. He wasn't just you attacking the block, were. he's attacking the, the Empire now. Um, I watched it the first time, and literally that opening moment with the, the, uh, the speeder. Downed, yes, with the, the speeder downed coming Star across Destroyer. towards the down. Oh. Yeah. But did you notice in the foreground that there's actually a crumpled X Wing as well? Yes. Yes. I didn't see that. I saw that second time. I didn't yes. see that for at least five or six times because <laughs> I was too busy going, it's a down Star Destroyer. Yes, but I did see what that. What a yeah. fucking amazing opening salvo for a trailer. Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Some really cool looking new characters as well. You've got um, Oscar Isaac in there as, uh, in his X-Wing as Poe Dameron. Uh, the most exciting looking character to me is this uh, funky looking silver stormtrooper. Mm-hmm who is apparently a female character yes. called Captain Phasma, yeah. which does sound a little bit like a, a cast-off from a Michael Jackson movie. Um, but I love the look of the character. It looks damn, damn good. I really like the new Stormtroopers. I yeah. think they look awesome. I like the fact that they've... they've all. If you look very closely, in the original Stormtroopers, they kind of had one squint eye almost. Right. And I don't know whether that was to do with how they cast the helmets. Um, fnaf fnaf. Uh, but it seems like they've kept that, that aesthetic in, even though they've brought it all up to date um, design wise. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, they look they look the business, don't they? Yeah. They really do Very look the business. Good. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to get it across on a podcast just how much I'm smiling and tingling all over at yeah. the thought of, of Christmas I mean, rolling around. I mean, it's interesting because I can remember in our 
in our previous podcast when we had a Star Wars special, you were a bit meh about the whole thing. Meh. I oh, wait and see. You didn't give a monkeys, and it's yeah. great to see you so energized, unbelievably energized about this. I mean, I was, I was, I was hoping for this. I was hoping that that they would show me something that was going to, you know, bring back that feeling I had. You know, from seeing Empire and from seeing Jedi and from seeing the you know the original movie. The original movie, obviously, I was one years old when it came out, but I, but I was reliably informed that on a previous podcast we did, I think I stated that Ghostbusters was the first film I saw in the cinema. Yes, but I spoke to my sister the other day and she said, "No, it wasn't. First film you saw in the cinema was Return of the Jedi, ah, cool. which was eighty three, and I uh, I didn't realise that. Not a bad one to begin with. Not a bad one indeed. But uh, was it eighty three Jedi? Eighty three was Jedi. It was Jedi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I myself though have to do a U turn because again in our previous podcast that we did, I said the problem is that people are expecting Star Wars to make them feel like they're children again, which they won't because we're all in our forties now. This does. does we're look. all suddenly feeling like we're eight, nine, ten yeah. again, which he's, is fantastic. He's really good, so, isn't he? so many people are saying J.J. Abrams has rescued my childhood that sort of George Lucas yeah. shat on a bit with the prequels, yeah. and now we're all suddenly feeling excited. But of course, they saved the best for last, the moment we all wanted to see, the thing we all wanted to hear. They did indeed, yes. Uh, let's address the Wookiee in the room. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what a line. What a lion! Brilliant. Not, not what a lion. What 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 a Wookie and what a lion! Yeah, yes. uh, yeah. Just that that great reveal with uh, with Han just saying, "Chewie, we're home." Brilliant. And Graham, do you know what I did after I saw that trailer for the first time? Did you wee yourself? Not only did I wee myself <laughs> quite a bit, I went straight online and I made sure I bagged the email address, Chewie, we're home <laughs> at hotmail dot com. You need help. I do need help, but email us at. Chewy, we're home at hotmail.com. And just tell us what you thought of the Star Wars trailer or send me some, you know, candid photos, whatever you want. You dressed as a Wookiee, maybe. You getting home. I don't care anything. One thing with note as well. Uh, Han, very grey. Yes. Wookiees evidently don't go grey. Well, of course, the thing is, Wookiees have a huge lifespan. Yeah. This was something that was pointed out very early on, you know, within the Star Wars mythos. But... The funny thing is that I assumed that Chewie was ageing because you look at him, how he changes in the reasonably short time period between Star Wars and Jedi. Yeah. And yet moving forward another 30 years, he's actually looking better. Now, whether that's just because he's clearly... Like he just slept out of a salon. Yay. Literally. He clearly has had some work done. Yeah. Um, He's had a trim. Yeah. Because in Jedi, he was looking quite uh, dishevelled as if he'd been... um, Dragged through a hedge backwards. Yeah, very much so. Was because he was in the uh, he was trapped in the the dungeon, wasn't he, in Jabba's palace? Well, even when he turned up there, he looked dishevelled. I love that look and he's got so, in, in Jabba's palace. Yes, his, his hair's all kind of. Yeah. and he's got the thing. Yeah, right. but he, it, he just looks awesome. It looks longer, but yeah, yeah. in this, he has he, aged a bit. Has he? He's done well. He looks. He looks ten years younger. He does. He, he's yes. done. He's done really well. And I'm going to give an honourable mention as well to the um, the accompanying celebration in Anaheim for yes. Star Wars which is obviously where they debuted this trailer for yeah. fans who had gone along for this celebration. Now, one thing they did on stage is they brought out on stage, obviously, your entire cast, or, well, say your entire cast, a majority of the big hitters. Uh, Ford wasn't there, obviously, because he's still recovering, I imagine, from his... Uh, broken leg. His broken leg from landing uh, a perfectly serviceable airplane on a, on a golf course. They brought out the cast. It was very amusing to hear Anthony Daniels uh, get his name wrong. Get his character's name CP3O. wrong. CP3O. Yeah, he got that completely wrong, didn't he? What a knob. Um, well, no, apparently he did that deliberately because when they were tweeting about what was going on, mm. they put loads of hashtags on it. Okay. And this is from the official Star Wars Twitter right, okay. uh, account. And they put hashtag CP3O, and it was him referencing that. Well, my apologies, Anthony Daniels. I, I, I stand corrected. What a funny guy, Andy Daniels. Hey. I like the way he references social media. And indeed. He's, he's so up to date. And he just, um, finger on the pulse. Finger on the pulse, indeed. The The final thing I'm going to say about this is they also brought out on stage one of the new astromech droids, yeah. BB-8. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I am fucked if I can work out how that thing works. But I did have a bit of a pop at that when it was in the first teaser trailer. Yeah, the football droid. Indeed. The soccer droid. But assuming that it was fully CGI'd, and then to see it come out and move about like that, absolutely incredible. It was and just fair to them. For, one thing we said when we spoke about it before was, I hope that they've learnt from the prequels not to go too CGI heavy. 
but to actually be creating physical effects like that, my hat is well and truly off to all of them. Fantastic. I, I love anything that I cannot work out how it works, and, and well done. Yeah. They, they fooled me. Absolutely. Very much so. Now, look, I think we could probably fill a whole episode just talking about this trailer, but we let's not. Could, but let's not. Because I've got cleaning and stuff to do in the monkey farm, and I want to get it, you know, all ready again for next yeah, episode of after this. Another trailer dropped the following day after the Star Wars trailer dropped. It did. But it didn't drop legally, did it? No. It leaked. And this is, good. this is quite interesting to me, actually, because you know what I'm like. I cannot wait for things like this. And if, if a leaked version comes online, I normally will watch it. Of course. And I must admit, this is the first time ever that I've watched a leaked trailer and wished I hadn't. Really? Okay. And I genuinely mean that. This is not just for this is not just to fill the air of the podcast. I genuinely regret watching this trailer and it's made me actually question whether I will watch any further leaked trailers when as and when they come out. For what reason? Because it made the film look shit. Obviously, we are talking about Batman v Superman. Dawn of Justice. The Dawn of Justice indeed, sir. It's amazing to me how stilted and how how awful, in fact, the leaked trailer made the film look. But it was all right, Graham, because you know what happened the next day? They brought it out. Of course they did. Early. DC decided that they were going to break their uh, their embargo on the trailer and release it early. It's supposed to be coming on Monday, I believe. And Monday, I think it was supposed to be shown at various IMAX cinemas correct. and then with Tuesday with an official worldwide right. release. And, and we will get to see it on the big screen as well because we're off to the cinema ourselves uh, very soon. We are, yes. More on that another time. Yes. But yes, the, the official trailer obviously now, as I say, it's out there. It's, it's, on, it's in the Webiverse. And I think it looks fucking great. I genuinely do. The, 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 the official trailer where you can see exactly what's going on. You can see how Snyder's lit the world. And you can see all these just little tiny moments that happen that you can't see in the, in the leaked one. So a little message to the people who leak these trailers. Stop fucking leaking them, to be honest. Because... I might be one of these people who'd watched that leaked trailer and then just gone, no, I have no intention of seeing that now because it looks absolute dump. Mm -hmm. And it amazed me just how how different I felt by seeing the official version. But then normally you love this sort of thing. And the problem is that whilst the internet exists, there will always be people who will want a scoop and want to get things out there and therefore it is unavoidable. Hopefully, anybody who watched the leaked trailer watched it because they're excited enough about the film that they're then going to watch the proper trailer now that it's out, and therefore they will realise that the leaked one didn't maybe do it justice, and Mm. therefore they will still want to see see the film. So you did that, didn't do it, didn't do it, the dawn of justice. Um, What did you think of the trailer? I thought it looked good. Um, I mean, clearly the whole thing, a Batman versus Superman, is that Superman's the Boy Scout, and therefore there needs to be a distrust of Superman because of his powers. But I kind of felt that it focused a little too much on that in the whole voiceover and various images we were seeing, and therefore, you know, can we trust this man? He is effectively a god, and what's his real plan? We don't know him. Um, And therefore, through that, Batman obviously preparing for the fact that this guy could go rogue but i love the dark knight returns references batman in the bat armor with the glowing eyes how did you feel about his voice modulator i afflectimus prime yeah but i'm excited to see it i've seen people online say that they wish there'd been a glimpse of wonder woman but i think that something like that is obviously still yet to come but just very excited to see it i mean as we've said before there's a whole lot of good stuff coming out and we're all chomping at the bit to get a look yeah i i, I particularly like the look of the uh the the armored bat suit yeah um once i'd seen the trailer i uh, we one year when we went to the comic con we we got these lovely i'm not sure if you got one actually one of the glenn fabry sketchbooks yes and there's a sketch in there of batman fighting superman yeah in in that scene and, yeah. and it is it's spot on yeah, yeah it very is much spot so. on and I quite like Affleck as, as the bat as no, well. I've, he, he I've, I've never possible. had a problem with the idea. I think that he will make a good Bruce Wayne. And I think, frankly, most people, probably Clooney aside, could pull off a good Batman. Yeah. Because, because you're downplaying it. You yeah. know, you're suddenly getting gravelly and serious. And yeah. I think the sign of a good actor is can he pull off a good Bruce Wayne. And I think Affleck, with his looks and his acting style, I think will be perfect for that. Indeed. I mean, great to get a look at the Batmobile. And, and uh, the, the Batwing the, the as bat well. The Batwing as well. I'm assuming it's going to be called that. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, there, there was plenty in there to keep us all talking. And, uh, Do you know what my favourite thing was? Go on. My favourite, favourite thing was actually Jeremy Irons' little voiceover. Oh, okay. I thought it was quite cool. 
I love Michael Caine as Alfred. Mm -hmm. I really do. I love Michael Caine as Alfred. I really do. I don't not know. a lot of people don't. Not though. a lot of people don't. But but Jeremy Irons just seems he seems a, he seems a good fit for it. I think. Yeah. He seems a very good fit for it. And of course, you you know you've got various other voiceovers going on in the background. Holly Hunter, Hunter, Holly Hunter noticed, yeah. sounding very sexy. Yes. And she's she's playing a senator, isn't she? She's playing a US senator. So. But yeah, again, this is another thing I think we could probably fill a whole episode we with. We could do, um, yes. But it's great. What it's, a great time. It what is. a great time it is. It is a great time. Now, we've got to wait till 2016, obviously, for, for that. So it's only a year. It's not far off. No. It's not far off. And we've got plenty to see us through till then. We have got plenty to see us through till then. Indeed, we have to. Um, final bit of news this week. I'm going to give you a uh, a Star Wars sandwich, if you will, in the Monkey Farm this week. So obviously, All righty then. Obviously, we'll start at the top with the amazing uh, uh, world peace bringing Star Wars uh, uh, Episode Seven trailer, and we're going to finish with the fact that the following day we had the announcement trailer and release trailer, if you like, or teaser trailer, whatever they call whatever the kids are calling them these days for the new Star Wars Battlefront game. Yeah. Which I have now shown you the trailer for. You You've have seen it, indeed. Uh, yeah, come on, let's let's have it. It looks awesome. It does. Look it cool. looks it beautiful. Does look very nice. Yes. Uh, you've got all your you've got all your, your your cool key things in there from Star Wars that you want. You know, you've got your cool blasters. You've got your you've got the ATATs. You've got the ATST. There's a lovely shot of Boba Fett flying up in the air and taking some mothers out. Um, wow, I've wanted a Battlefront game to look like that for years and obviously you know you pointed out when we watched the trailer yeah but it probably won't look like that in well it did it, make a point of saying yeah. game engine footage yeah. rather than in game, in -game footage, footage yeah. so but then I of mean, course you know I have no experience of next gen consoles and you then made the point that they very much look like this anyway yeah and that's probably sort of seeing that is the slight disappointment for me is knowing that a game that good looking and that playable will be out there and I won't be playing it because I mean for you it will probably be a godsend because there is no single player campaign oh okay this is an online only game so it's ah. multiplayer only there will be um, missions that you can carry out with maybe a team of three other players I believe um, you can switch seamlessly between first person and third person uh, view or you can even do now what the, the latest GTA does you can be in first person for certain parts of it and third person for other parts without clicking you can just set it to do it automatically yeah. um, I mean we should point out that Scott is a massive gamer I mean Scott games for about would you say about 33 hours a day yeah yeah that's about, about uh, right he's, yeah. he's spent on his PS4 just gaming 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 he I have got him. massive thumbs yes indeed I, however, am still rattling along with my old Xbox 360 and having two young children and little time to do most of the things that I want to do, there's no point me investing 300 plus quid in a next generation console that is going to sit there gathering dust. No, certainly so not. So I'm pretty much now in terms of gaming obsolete because I would say last year was the last time you were going to get games coming out on old and new gen. It's all new gen now and so unfortunately for the next... Uh, <laughs> X years I'm going to be uh, taking a back seat on the gaming front but of course I do still have a massive pile of unplayed 360 games that I should be very much enjoying playing but yeah the games reviews and uh, and opinion will very much have to come from you well uh, we're going to have to wait a little while longer before I can give an opinion on this one um, November 17th this year yep. it comes out it's going to ship with downloadable content which should tie in to the opening of the movie. Oh, okay. So apparently we are going to get to find out just how that Star Destroyer was down. Fantastic. I like that. Yep. I'm all for a bit of that. Graham, that, sir, is the monkey farm. That is your Star Wars sandwich. And what a monkey farm it was. And as I always say, please get out of my monkey farm. It's exciting times, but I'm excited to be leaving. Yes, good. Okay, now we'll move on to this week's quick hits. <laughs> Quick hits. Right, sir. I think we shall start with you. What have you got for us? I have got a lovely little zombie film. Oh, you love a zombie film. I do love a zombie film. I'm hoping um, that the listeners are not trying, uh, not starting to think I'm a one-trick pony with my love of zombies. If they do, well, fuck them, because zombies are awesome, and any time I get to watch a new zombie film, I will. I love Australian Did films. Did you just say about our wonderful audience, fuck them? <laughs> Would I say that? <laughs> I think you I did. Think if, I think if you rewind <laughs> back and you listen, the message was was not anything as... Uh, maybe I did say that. 
If you play Scott saying fuck them backwards, it actually says, I love you all very much. It says, subscribe. (laughs) It's like one of those hidden things in a Pink Floyd uh, record. Um, Yeah, uh, I've got a lovely little Australian zombie movie called Wormwood, A Road of the Dead. Wormwood spelt W-Y-R-M-W-O-O-D. Okay. All right. Now, there is some significance to the Wormwood thing. I believe it's a biblical reference. I'm not going to go into that because we don't need to, really. Mm-hmm. fact of the matter is, last time I saw uh, a, a, an Australian zombie movie was a movie called Undead, which f- was f- a fabulous, fabulous movie. I genuinely, genuinely think Australians make great movies. Uh, I genuinely, genuinely think Australians make great horror movies as well. I mean, Peter Jackson with things like Brain Dead and uh, Bad Taste, mm-hmm. you know, just real great gross-out uh, yeah. horror comedies. This, a little bit lighter on the comedy. Wolf Creek. Was quite a nasty sort of horror from yeah, there. Yeah. The Babadook, that was. Uh, was Babadook that... was a great Australian movie. Australian, yes, um, and of course, you know, the granddaddy of them all, the, the Mad Max movies. You know, yes. Yes. Australia, a solid film making country. I don't, I don't have no understanding why they all come over here to get jobs in bars. They should be making films. <laughs> they really should because they seem to be bloody good at it. Anyway, I digress. Wormwood is set just on the eve of a zombie apocalypse. So our story follows this bunch of characters whose paths all do eventually cross at one stage during the film. Okay? okay, I think the film for me is notable for one thing and one thing alone. Something different in the zombie genre that I've actually been acceptant of. Okay, you know normally Bloody we, hell. I know, and you're going. I'm not sure whether you'll like it or whether you'll just say that is shit. Okay. Now I, I've watched this film twice now, and the first time I watched it, I was like, yeah, "It's a little bit cheesy," but mm. and the second time I watched it, I was like, "No, actually, that's that's quite clever. I like that." The the virus that has kind of created these zombies also has affected how fuel works in the real world. <laughs> I know it sounds shit, doesn't it? But when you see it in the film, it kind of makes sense. The virus has also turned the zombies' blood kind of into a fuel. So the only re- the only way they can run vehicles and such is to kind of modify them, and they have to catch zombies and plumb them into these cars. Graham's face right now is just completely and utterly solidly blank. In fact, he kind of looks like a hairy Rorschach. He was a, he was a DJ, wasn't he? In the uh... oh, yeah, maybe we won't speak <laughs> no, about him. Don't go about that. Um, it's your basic, uh, you know, um, little guys versus hordes of flesh-eating monsters story. Right. But I would advise you very strongly to go out and watch it, just purely for the fact that it's something different. And it's competent in what it's doing. one thing that I should ask is that, is the zombie blood, um, is it unleaded? Is it sort of more ecologically friendly? Fuck you! See, if you weren't so busy with your real life, you could watch (laughs) these films and we could discuss them properly. But no! No, you're just coming here with your is it unleaded jokes, <laughs> thinking you're all that. Anyway, yeah, one Wormwood. question though. One question. You've had one question. What? I'll allow you one more. Go on. Why have I never heard of this? I think it's, it did go very much under the radar. It came yeah. out 2014. I've got a funny feeling it's been held back over here. I was just very lucky that I know someone who knows someone, and I got to see a screening of it. Oh, okay. Like that. Yeah. Well, we'll say no more about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want a sausage roll while you tell us how you watched it? I literally downloaded it. It's not getting the highest ratings, I must admit, on uh, on things like IMDb. But it's a really, really good little film. And, it's, uh, it's, uh, and, and motoring news. And motoring news, yeah. <laughs> Road of the Dead. It's, it's a fun little film. I really would urge you to watch it because it's got some very inventive kills in it. It's got some really, really cool little moments. The main character in it, Barry, is played by a, a chap called Jay Gallagher, or Gallagher, however we're going to pronounce it. And he is just, he's, he's very, very good. He's very convincing as a man who's lost everything and, uh, and now has to kind of traverse his way through this uh, apocalyptic wasteland. I'm imagining it as being in some tiny little outback town rather than in a, in a modern city. Am I That's right all there is in Australia, so I've read. <laughs> I don't think they have big cities. I think the only thing that they've got in Australia that's of any note is the Sydney Opera House, and then the rest of it is just dirt roads. Right, okay. I'm pretty positive, anyway. I've never been. 
Yeah. You, you may be better talking to someone the who... Sydney uh, Opera House and Ramsey Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, know, you may be better speaking to someone who's got some geographical knowledge of the country. But Maybe I should but, be. But from what I've read, Graham, I believe it is mainly just dirt roads and, uh, and back alley attacks. Cool. Wormwood, anyway. Road of the Dead. Uh, <laughs> see it, if you dare. Uh, see how many miles to the gallon you can get out of it. I loved it, Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Right, what have you got for us this week? Okay, Scott. Bear in mind, I'm going to talk all the way over your entire quick hit this as, week. As well you should. Yeah. Because so tell us what it is. Because this is a discussion podcast. It is a discussion. It is a discussion, you're right. Tell us what you've got. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on tenter hooks. Back in the day, you introduced me to something I was a bit late on board with, and that was the League of Gentlemen. I thought you were going to say late night fella slapping. No, uh, not that. Shame. That's another quick hit. Did I introduce you? It was a quick hit as well. You did. Did I introduce you to League of you, Gentlemen? Uh, we were in the pub once and you said to me, oh, what do you think of League of Gentlemen? And I went, what do I think of what? And you went, you're kidding me. You're not watching it? And I was like, no. And I then started watching it and that's how I got into League of Gentlemen. Well, I'm very proud. I was and aware. have uh, followed the careers of Messrs Pemberton, Shearsmith and Gatiss. Ever since, and of course, Gatiss has gone off to do his Sherlock's and his Doctor Who writing and what have you, and uh, Steve Pemberton and Rhys Shearsmith have very much carried on their writing together. Uh, they've obviously had separate projects, but have written together, did Psychoville, and then have come up with a cracking little concept called Inside Number 9, and that yes. is my quick hit for this episode. And what a fine, fine quick hit. It is brilliant. It's a great TV series. Uh, series 1 is available on DVD. It came out last year. And Series 2 is on our screens right now. I think at the point we're recording, we have had four episodes. But I'm going to very much focus on the first series. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a TV show on our screens on ITV called... (laughs) Called Tales of the Unexpected. Roald Dahl's Tales of the Unexpected, no less. Which always told these sort of quite... Well, sometimes they could be little comedy tales. Sometimes they, they could be little dark tales. But they always had a Ooh, great... Sorry. Yes, they always had a little a great twist at the ending. And I would say that Inside Number 9 has taken that concept and built on it and improved upon it. And what we've got is each episode is 27 minutes of absolute television gold. Yeah. There, um, there is not one single bad episode no, in that first no. season. I mean, there is uh, six episodes in the first season. The first one is my favourite, which was Sardines. Sardines. Which takes place mostly inside a wardrobe. Yeah. And it is a family who are playing a game of sardines where you have to hide and then as you find people you hide with them and so this great ensemble cast featuring uh catherine parkinson tim key uh ophelia lovibond uh, Anne reed julian ryan tut anna chancellor mark wooden timothy west was in it wasn't he can you Um, just say ophelia lovibond again is that her name yes say it again for me ophelia lovibond Oh, I'd like to feel it. You're love bond. <laughs> She's obviously from Elementary recently, as well as the Noel Clark movie Four Three Two One. And yeah, it's just a fantastic story. Uh, it's a family with a dark secret, but various little interjections along the way. Steve Pemberton plays the brother, but I think it's stolen by Reese Shearsmith as the gay friend. Who oh, he's is absolutely, absolutely good at it. He's so yeah. good, and. The twist at the end of that one is phenomenal. It yeah. is, I mean, for a first episode, it knocked out of the park. It was fantastic. Uh, the second one, funny enough, I found to be the weakest of the six, which was A Quiet Night In, which was the almost silent episode. Where, oh, which I love. Now, you see, I was disappointed by it. This uh, is the guys who are trying to steal trying the to piece of in. art. That, that's right. They're breaking into yeah. the house, uh, which Dennis Lawson and Una Chaplin, I think, yeah. isn't it? play the bickering couple yeah. while they're breaking into the house and trying to steal it and yeah sort of an interesting concept again nice twist at the end great twist but yeah probably my least favourite of the of the six I would have to say the next one Tom and Jerry uh, in which Shearsmith plays a teacher stroke struggling writer who oh who, yes friends, who has a tramp played by Steve Pemberton come to his door to return his wallet and genuinely eerie. Yes, and Gemma Arterton plays Reese Shearsmith's girlfriend, who's yeah. constantly saying, "Why are you trusting this man? Why are you? Why are you doing so?" 
and the twist at the end one is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, anybody who thinks they saw that coming, forget it. You got, you're making me want to go and watch these all <laughs> right now. You really are. The next one is called Last Gasp. Which was the, this is the balloon, the balloon episode, it, yeah. yes, where Tamsin Greg plays somebody who works for it, it's sort of a, a, a bit of a make a wish type That's uh, company. Right, yeah. I think it's called Wishmaker UK or something like that. And there's this young girl, and she wants to see her favourite pop star, yeah. who turns up on her birthday, and he's helping them blow up balloons and he obviously has some sort of an aneurysm while he's blown up the balloon and dies and they suddenly realise that they have the balloon that contains his very last breath. What a great great <laughs> premise for, a, for a, just a 30 minute skit. Yeah. It, it, it's now, brilliant. now this one doesn't have a massive twist does it? It's just very clever and very well played amongst them all. I mean, it, it's the first one that Shear Smith's not in isn't it? Because That's right, Pemberton yeah. plays the dad. And, and who's the young lad who, who seems to show up in a lot of things? The young Asian lad who's in it, who's kind of the he's he's one of the PAs. I think. Yes, I, I can't he's remember his name. He's particularly good at yes. it. I can't remember yeah. his name. It might be Riz Ahmed. I think his name is something, something along those lines. But he's very very good at it as well. Yeah. The next one is the understudy, in which I'm struggling to remember Steve that. Steve Pemberton. Uh, it's a production of Macbeth. Oh yes. And Steve Pemberton plays the main star with Reece Shearsmith as his understudy, whose girlfriend is very much getting in his ear to say, "You should be the star of this." Yeah. And a lovely twist at the end, but funny enough, what I hadn't realised, but mainly because I've never seen it, it actually tells the story of Macbeth. I've never seen Macbeth, but okay. being that the play they're in is Macbeth, it's actually based on the play Macbeth. Which and I, I would clear. never, that would have never filtered through to me no. because I too have never seen Macbeth. Yes. Macbeth is the Scottish play, is the that Scottish play? Yeah, yes, yeah. indeed. And yeah, then the final part, which whilst not my favourite, was certainly the most frightening among them, and probably one of the most frightening things I've ever seen, was the harrowing. Again, what? I can't remember this last what? episode. Mischief. Oh, yes! Oh, oh my God! God, yes, that's fucking petrifying. <laughs> it's so yeah. scary, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, this tells the story of... Um, it's Amy Fion Edwards, I think is her name. She's been in The Detectorists and was also in, um, what was that thing that Kathy Burke did, uh, the, the series she did of herself as a young girl. It's something like kicking and screaming. Mm. Anyway, she is hired by this couple to house it for them and they go out for the evening because they have a disabled brother who lives up in the attic and yeah. she's told, don't go up there and you won't hear anything from him, so don't worry about it. But of course, suddenly she hears a bell ringing, yeah. and the couple are played by Rhys Shearsmith and an actress whose name completely escapes me. I can see her face, but can't remember her name. And they're but, brilliantly Adam's family. Well, this is it. They, you, you, <laughs> you think the twist is going to be there, some sort of a vampire, yeah. because they're very much like that. In fact, I think at one point Shearsmith's character actually does say, "I'm not a vampire," you know. That's right. Yeah. Um, but the ending is properly properly scary it is oh the, i mean yeah. that one literally when i watched it i probably had to rewind it and watch it obviously on sky plus several times because it just gave me goosebumps it properly scared me um but the whole concept of the series is that as it suggests each episode is set inside a number nine yeah and so in the first episode the bedroom because they're in quite a big sort of stately home aren't they playing right, sardines yeah. and the bedroom is number nine the ninth bedroom um, in A Quiet Night In the house is number nine in Tom and Jerry the flat is number nine in Last Gasp the house is number nine in The Understudy they're in dressing room number nine and the sort of gothic mansion that Harrowing takes place in is number nine. So each of them is set inside something that's number nine. And they probably use that a lot more imaginatively in series two. Yeah. Um, for example, the ninth sleeping carriage of a train was the first Lack episode. Of shit. Absolutely. Which I thought was superb. But it is a great, great series. If you like comedy, if you like unusual tales, but with a great twist... Give it a go. They definitely it's... are the scholars, aren't they? They do. Oh, they do it very, very well. Yeah, and it, and it just shows through their love of things like Tales the Unexpected and yes. the early, very campy Hammer films as yes. well, especially in the Harrowing. I mean, they've always said that they're big fans of horror and comedy, but the yeah. main influence is horror, and I think that certainly comes through in the Harrowing. Um, yeah, you know, every episode has an aspect of comedy, an aspect of drama, but 
there's always that underlying sense of dread and horror that runs throughout all of them. And uh, yeah, great show. Give yeah. it a go. Long may their their reign of dread and terror reign. Yes. Okay, now we'll move on to this week's main topic. When they got the bar, you know they won't drop it. The geek man and fools discuss the main topic. We've mentioned before about how this is a great time for geeks in terms of movies and TV adaptations of comics. And one that's very new to our screens is Marvel's Daredevil, spinning out from the... uh, some say B-list character, but it's my second favourite comic character behind Spider-Man. And there's a new series on Netflix, which came out a couple of weeks ago. We've both watched all 13 episodes, so we thought we'd have a chat about it and uh, see what we thought. So we will pre-warn you as well. It's going to be quite spoilerific, I'd imagine, this episode. I'm going to try not to spoil the main parts of the show for people. We will talk about aspects of the show, but we won't give away anything major storyline-wise. For one second then, when you said aspects, I heard Affleck. And I was like, no, no more fucking Affleck. No more Affleck you, you Daredevil. Have Affleck on the brain. I have, yes, indeed I have. Um, so, Scott, what did you think? Do you know, I was just going to ask you the same question. Okay. I wholeheartedly can say I think this is one of my favourite TV shows that I've ever seen. Okay. I really do mean that. I, I, I thought every single episode built perfectly on each other. When it, when you get to that final episode thirteen, and you know the consequences of what ha- what has happened throughout every episode preceding it, yeah, it just all fitted together so well. Mm-hmm. I'm just hoping that you liked it. What did you think? Well, oh. as I say, I am a huge Daredevil fan. I know you are. There is not a Daredevil comic in existence that I have not read. Yeah. So. Does that mean I'm going into this with unrealistically high expectations? I don't know. So all I can say is that I watched the first episode and for me, it was exactly like reading a comic. It was fantastic. It... Insert here music of Mexican. <laughs> da, 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 yeah, awesome. They yeah. nailed it. They did, absolutely they? nailed it. Yeah. Characterization. The relationship between uh, particularly Foggy and Matt was straight out of the comics. Yeah. When I first saw Eldon Henson as Foggy, I thought, oh, God, are they going to get this right? But then very soon realised they got it exactly right. He was far more than just comic relief, though. He was there for a certain amount of comic relief. Yeah. But he was, he was a little annoying, wasn't he, the first couple of episodes because it, it, of this comic relief thing. Yes. But I think then they dialed him in a bit. Well, I mean, particularly episode 10 which, again, we won't give away the story, but it's this called Nelson, Nelson versus, versus Murdoch. Murdoch. Yeah. And there he became such a well-rounded character yeah. and a hugely sympathetic character. Boy, can act. Yeah, absolutely. Boy, I mean, can I, really act. I, I haven't seen him since Idle Hands, which was, what, back in about 2000 or something? That's where I know him from! <laughs> yes. Oh, my God, you, you just thought I'd have researched this before we did <laughs> I'm, I've watched every episode of that show thinking, where the fuck do I know this foggy dude from? <laughs> and, and I uh, love that film. That it's a good such film. such a good film. Him and Seth Green play so yeah. well off each other as, as the wacky stoner oh, frames. God, just, that's blown my mind. <laughs> that has blown my mind. Doesn't Seth Green that get a bottle in his yes, head? Yeah. And it's the lad from Final Destination. Devon Sauer. Yes. Devon Sauer. Yeah, yeah. Great film, actually. Yeah. yeah. But not what we're here to no, talk about. We're here to talk indeed about not. the absolute. I tell you what, as well. Think I've got a new man crush. Go on, Charlie Cox. Charlie Cox. Not just because his surname is Cox at all, but <laughs> um, no, I loved him. I loved him in uh, in in uh, Boardwalk Empire because he, of course, played. Did uh, you love him in Stardust? No, because I fucking hate Stardust. It's, it's a terrible. <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry to people who do love Star- Stardust. And uh, sorry, Jonathan Ross, if you are listening, um, I know you know. Your that, wife your, co-wrote your, it. Your wife co-wrote that, but I, I fucking cannot stomach that film. I think it's awful. So let's move back to Charlie to, Cox, yes, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I think I've got a new man crush, Charlie Cox. He, he's, uh, and the best thing about this character is he wouldn't see me coming, so um, we like that a lot. Ba-dum. Ba-dum. Ciao. What a cast, what a brilliantly written show, and just cannot wait for the second season. But how violent. I know. One thing that did surprise me, and I know that obviously... 
the gloves are off, if you pardon the expression, yeah. because this is not on an American network. It is only being shown on Netflix, and so they didn't have the limitations of that. But holy cow, yeah. the bit in at the start of episode three when the two guys are fighting in the bowling alley and he snaps oh, yeah. his arm and you yeah. see the bone come out of the arm and then he bends it back even further. Yeah. Oh! Well, and also that character himself yes, has but, a particularly sticky ending, does Indeed, he? but obviously we won't spoil that. No. But Jesus, when he did that, I was like, yeah. what? Did he just do that? Do Incredible. you think this is why it's been as successful as it has? Because they've allowed this level of violence in it? Well... The funny thing is, again, being a Daredevil fan, one thing that you have to realise is that Matt doesn't have a physical superpower. His superpower is that because he lost his sight in to sort of radioactive goo, it heightened his other senses to such a level that he can see by the sound that bounces off things, and so he almost sort of has a has a bat like radar yeah. sense. And he can hear conversations that are taking place three blocks away. Yeah, yeah. And he can read a newspaper, a normal newspaper, simply by running his hand over it and feeling the ink raised off the paper. And he can obviously, as he's featured heavily in this, tell if somebody's lying because he can hear people's yeah, heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he has his heightened senses. But other than that, his physical ability is no more than that of a gifted athlete. And one thing that is constantly focused on within the comics is when he fights somebody, he does take a good beating. Yeah. And I would say one thing people are probably surprised about is you've got a superhero who frequently gets his ass handed to him. He comes away in proper bits. And normally we're used to Iron Man, Captain America, all these people who have these power Thor people who have these powers that allow them to take some serious licks but this mm. is just a guy like you and me and therefore if you punch him in the face a few times he's going to feel that and he's going to react to that and he's effectively tooling around for most of the show in his pyjamas isn't he <laughs> yes with a black mask with a black mask wrapped around his, his eyes so yeah not very well protected from the elements no of, it. So of course he, 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 as you say he is constantly being uh, sliced diced bashed and just generally you know dragged um, all around the place I mean, so much so that episode two begins with him lying in a dumpster having yeah. had the absolute shit beaten out of him and he's rescued by the lovely rosario dawson who, Swoon. who, who i didn't know was going to be in it was, I didn't. It was a lovely surprise i can only imagine that her character is going to turn into the marvel character night nurse, night nurse yeah. yes yeah um, whose name wasn't Claire in the comics, but is a character who effectively helps patch up any superheroes who come He's to a, Effectively the field medic for, 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 yes. for all, all superheroes yes. in the area. Absolutely. Um, great setting as well, obviously, Hell's Kitchen. Yeah. Um, really, really dark and, Very and dark. foreboding. Yeah. Um, the look of the show. It was, as, as, as you say, the setting is very dark, and you know a lot of a lot of the action does take place at night. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that took anything away from it? Did you feel that there were certain things that you know were you, were you getting a little bit bored of it constantly being set at set at night, or did you want to see more daytime fighting, more daytime scenes, or, or were, you, were you happy with the the level of lawyer by day, well, ass kicker by night? Well, this is it because we. I, one thing that did strike me as, as odd is because Matt took such huge beatings, mm. he was off work for a lot of time. Yeah. And obviously, the big beating that he took, he took a long time to recover from. And therefore, you know, you'd start to think, would questions not be asked? And they sort of tried to fob it off. But therefore, because he's a lawyer by day, he is very much a vigilante by night. Yeah. And, and so most of his stuff, plus you would have to think that most crime, be it smuggling, burglary, robbery, anything like that is going to take place at night because you aren't going to be doing stuff in broad daylight. And so, yes, I think you kind of bought into the concept yeah. of that very much. A lot harder for him to, obviously, as you say, cover for it. I mean, because unlike characters like Batman, the uh, you know he hasn't really got a day job, has he? He's just no. a, uh, another another playboy, as it were, like, like like Tony Stark is. But but yeah, I thought they handled the, the, the whole thing just brilliantly. Did you have a favourite episode out of the 13? I mean, the first one was very good. I, I felt, in a funny way, do you know what? I don't often binge watch programmes. No, I know, because when I spoke to you in the week, you actually said the words, I'm struggling through Daredevil. And that, to me, I thought, oh shit, he doesn't like it. That was why I used the word struggling. You are such a why, you! I didn't want to show you my hand. Uh, I wanted you to think that I was hating yeah. it. No, I wasn't genuinely struggling, but... I found that when I'm watching one episode after another, 
they kind of merge together. Yeah. And so it's hard to say. I mean, one episode that did stand out to me was episode 10, Nelson versus Murdoch, which I thought was far more a character-driven piece. There was less sort of fighting and violence. It was, well, again, I won't spoil it, but it was two people arguing and also you getting a feel of their backstory as well, yeah. which was great. Um, so many things happen within episodes that made me go, oh, I'm loving this. Oh, this is superb. That it's so hard. Unless something big happened like episode 10 yeah. or indeed the ending. It's sort of hard to say, oh, that was episode 6, whereas that was episode 8. They kind of all bleed together. But if I had to go for it, I would say 10. You'd say episode 10. Yeah. I, I absolutely adored episode 7. I think it was episode 7. Stick. Yes. Yes. With the, uh, uh, again... Scott uh, Glenn. Scott Glenn as, as Stick was just jaw-droppingly good, wasn't he? He was... He, he was just he was that character mm. for, for, I mean, you obviously know know the comics very very well mm. I've only really been privy to uh, The Man Without Fear yeah which I read as a trade paperback yeah and I think before I'd met you okay I've got a funny feeling that one of our listeners a friend of ours John Carlin actually turned me on to, to that particular book and it's very rare as you well know that I remember a comic but as I'm watching watching this show I'm, I'm thinking my god I remember this mm. I remember this so, for, you know, for, for it was, the number of years it must have been since I've read that. Yeah. And for me to be having little flashbacks and going, that, I mean, that's testament to how good this show yeah. is, it, it has I been mean, put together. They took an awful lot out of the comics. You know, there was yeah. an awful lot that almost seemed for seen. you thinking, oh, yeah, that bit's from that comic and that bit. But there was plenty that wasn't taken from the comics that I thought was really good as well. So they got the balance just right. I thought they played it really well. Cast wise. I mean, obviously, we touched very briefly at the beginning on Charlie Cox and Eldon Henson as uh, Murdoch and Nelson. Yeah. And we have spoken a little bit about the delicious Rosario Dawson. Yes. What do you think of the rest of the supporting cast? Well, I think first off, you have to take a massive hat off to Vincent D'Onofrio as well. Do you know what? I'm not just going to take my hat off. I'm going to give him a round of applause. Was that man born to play? He was super. And when I heard he was playing, I thought, "Has has he got enough to pull it off? But... He almost seemed to bulk up weight-wise yeah. over the course of the series. But he just nailed it. In many times, I felt he was channeling Orson Welles. Yeah. He played it in a very Orson Welles manner. I, I, I'll i agree with that. I will agree with that. That's a, that's a really good call, actually. He uh, Every now and again, he slips into his, his, his voice that he uses in Men in Black. <laughs> I don't know if you <laughs> yes, notice. I, know what, uh, you I, think, I, know I what you can't mean. remember what the character's name is in Men in Black. Yeah. But, I don't want to give me a cup of water. <laughs> he does sound a little bit like that, but yeah. fuck me if that is not one of the most menacing villains that, yes. that has ever been put to screen. And the fact that his reach throughout the city yeah. meant that throughout the course of the story, Nelson Murdoch and also Karen Page, who will come up to, mm. knew that they couldn't really trust anybody, never knew who, who was not on their side. And some of the things that happened, one thing in particular that springs to mind is, and again, I won't say what the circumstance was, but a SWAT team coming into a building and finding a cop tied up to a bar. Yeah. And the guy just saying, officer such and such, he's dead. And he's very much a live officer, looks him confused, and he just puts a knife into his throat. We might as well call him Marvin Nash. (laughs) Indeed. Uh, And clearly because these cops were working for Fisk. And I think that his reach throughout the whole thing was fantastic. Now, Karen Page, played by, I can't remember the actress's name. It's a uh, a three-bar gate. Delightful Deborah Ann Wall. Deborah Ann Wall, that's it. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to sound awful. But I'm hoping what I say after that will pull it back. Is this going to offend Deborah? Uh, well, when I first saw her, and I thought, oh, I wonder if that's going to be Karen Page. And when they said the name is Karen Page, I thought, in the comics, Karen Page is a lot better looking than that. She starts off being quite innocent and sort of turns into, well, I won't tell you the comic life of Karen Page, but she's a bit of a babe, a bit of a honey. Mm. And I sort of felt that she maybe wasn't that. And therefore I thought, oh God, is that going to be Karen Page? But then I thought her character was fantastic. I thought her gutsiness. And, she's a great actress yeah, as well. She absolutely nailed the part. I was really, and they deviated a lot from what she was like in the comic. Okay. Um, but I thought that really suited the style and the feel of the series. I have got a question for you. Go on. Fisk's right hand man. Not in the comics. He's not, is he? But what a great character Wesley yeah. is. James Wesley. I thought he was superb. He was fantastic. He's brilliant, but, wasn't he? But, I mean, he played it very calm and collected, but clearly a nasty piece of work under yeah. that. The way that he talks to people always had this air of respect, but this underlying 
nastiness and fuck you d- attitude. Don't, to, uh, don't mess with me. Yeah, and, in, in particular, some of the scenes with him and um, Bob Gunton, who's playing Leland Owsley, yeah. were particularly good. Yes. Uh, because there's obviously this... Uh, Wesley is very much looked after by Wilson Fisk. And yeah. I think Fisk sees him as kind of almost extended family, almost like a son. That, well, he actually refers to him as his friend at one point. He does, yeah, and, indeed. And, and this is a man who has very few friends. Yeah, indeed. And it is great just to see the interaction between him and Owsley because Owsley obviously is a bit of a conniving git as well, isn't he? Uh, a character from, from the comics as well, is, am I right? He was the owl, is that right? The owl, yes. The, the owl or the owl? The, the owl. The owl. One thing that I loved about the show was the various names that were coming up and as a fan, obviously you're watching it as somebody who's discovering these characters for the first time. I'm watching it from a slightly different perspective whereby I know a lot of these characters and therefore the moment the character was referred to as Leland, mm. I was thinking, it's Leland Owsley, it's the owl, fantastic. The moment Fisk met the woman working at the gallery, I was waiting and hoping that she would say her name was Vanessa because yeah, yeah. obviously in the comics Vanessa Fisk is it's, Wilson Fisk's yeah, wife. Yeah. I think that is actually my second favourite episode, the, the Vanessa introduction episode. Right, okay. This is the rabbit in a snowstorm, I believe yes. it's called, isn't it? Yes. Brilliant, brilliant. brilliant and stuff. Melvin Potter as well, the guy. The gladiator. Yes, who in the comics was the gladiator, which was a villain that Daredevil fought in his very early days, but in his civilian life worked in a costume designer yeah. and eventually became a huge fan of Daredevil and worked with Daredevil and sort of creates costumes and various things yeah. for various um, you, can uh, see little, you can see little nods of that in his workshop as well you can see little various sketches of uh, of the, the gladiator outfit in yes there as well, well work course gladiators weapons were the saw blades and of okay. course at one point he does pick up and throw a circular saw blade at Daredevil and of right. course, as a fan of the comics you yeah. go yeah like yeah. that love the reference yeah. but of course the main one being Ben Urich now of course in the comics Ben Urich is white but, and Joe Pantoliano. Yeah. But when I saw him at the start of episode three, when he was chatting to sort of a, obviously a former gangster, mm. my immediate thought was, oh, I wonder if that's going to be Ben Urich. And it was. And that he was great to see as well. You know, yeah. for, so it was lovely as a fan of the not only the Marvel Universe, but specifically the Daredevil Universe to see all these characters names get used. Um, but of course, with that came a little bit of disappointment as well oh, in okay. terms of um, how they were used, because the owl in the comics is a crime boss yeah, who very much works against the kingpin. And that wasn't using this. So I was kind of anticipating something going along those lines and that never panned out. And, um, you know, whilst they may use the names, if they're not using them in the way that when you first hear them, you think, oh, great, because that's obviously going to lead to that. And then it doesn't. Obviously, they can't do a literal translation from comic to TV. No, not not everything that works on the page is going to work on the screen and vice versa. Of course not. Um, Yeah, funny enough, you going back to the rabbit in the snowstorm, I thought that was a fantastic plot device using the white picture that he yeah. bought from the gallery yeah. and then him always waking up from a nightmare and looking at it and then of course in the story of his childhood of him as a child finding out why that was that was yeah. a superb plot device that was so well done and brilliant. again we won't ruin that but no, it, anybody it, watching it brilliantly brilliantly written and I must say every time I saw Vincent D'Onofrio on screen I kind of imagined him on the front cover of a comic leering over the city you know just kind of standing there and it, for him to pull off that character, I think, is a real coup. Absolutely. Oh. If they're going to be handing out awards for, for TV shows you know, over the next year or so, this really deserves to get some. Oh, yeah. Again, it's only one of a planned... I think there's a further four shows coming out that are all going to kind of link up, yes. aren't they? So we're going to have... Um, was it AKA Jessica Jones? Yeah. Uh, uh, Luke Cage? Yeah. Iron Fist? Uh, yes. And, and is there... Defenders. Defenders, there you go. So yeah. And these are all going to kind of interlink, aren't they? Yes. They're all going to, they're all going to fit together very nicely. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? Just 13 episodes of, effectively 13 short films. One thing that did surprise me, Mm. and again, I can't understand the reason for the omission, is Wilson Fisk in the comics is the kingpin, the kingpin of crime, but known by everyone as the kingpin. And I like the fact that at the beginning, Wesley was saying, don't say his name, don't say his name. And they worked out it was because if no one says his name, then he doesn't exist. Yeah. I don't know why he wasn't then referred to as the kingpin because the idea is that in the comics Wilson Fisk is a legitimate businessman 
and the kingpin of crime rules the city and not many people know that they're the same person and right. therefore that would have been a perfect way around that to yeah. have him be referred to as the kingpin and nobody actually know that he's Wilson Fisk and I don't understand why they didn't do that because you show anybody who's a comic fan a picture of Wilson Fisk and say who's that none of them will say Wilson Fisk they'll all say it's the kingpin yeah no you're right so you're I don't right. understand why they didn't do that it would have helped from a plot device you know from the whole don't say his name they could have just said the kingpin the kingpin the kingpin and then Wilson Fisk comes out as this legitimate businessman who wants to save Hell's Kitchen I don't know why they didn't use it so throughout the entire show it's obviously peppered with little references to the comic and little easter eggs if you like yep. for the fans Without being too spoilerific, could you pick one that you thought really stood out for you? I loved, again, in episode 10, there was a conversation between Foggy and Matt. They were walking along and they sat on the stairs. I know what you're going to say. And Foggy referred to, they were taking them, Matt was taking them, the mickey out of Foggy for having taken, was it Korean or something? Swahili, was it? Swahili, that's it, because there was a girl that he liked. Yeah. And Foggy referred to Matt in his Spanish lessons as being with the Greek girl yeah the Greek girl obviously being Electra Axios yeah. and, and I thought that was a very clever reference yeah. and again one of those things when you hear you just go oh yeah well done very well played For but me, no other mention or sight or anything about her other no, than no but don't worry about that because she is confirmed as his bullseye for season yes. two yes so yeah I think that for them to get that in in such a subtle way where if you don't know it you wouldn't get the reference yeah. at all was brilliant yeah for me I really enjoyed Vanessa and Wilson uh, at dinner and her casually mentioning that another gentleman had tried to court her her describing him as dressed all in white with an ascot <laughs> and being hmm how strange <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is Kingpin's kind of, you know, signature look, isn't it? Yes. The white suit, the ascot tie with the diamond stud in the middle of it. Yeah. And I like, I, it wouldn't have worked. It would have looked really, really silly in a TV show, wouldn't it? It, it just wouldn't have worked. So, on the whole, I think, um, I think a, a, a wise wardrobe decision on their part. Yes. And in fact, I think the whole show, wardrobe wise, looked really, really good. Yeah. It was really, it was really, really uh, believably done. Yeah. Love the black pajama suit. I mean, it's not a spoiler to say this. You are going to get to see the suit in the show. The red suit, uh, the red and black. Yeah. And I really like the suit. And I must admit, the foreshadowing to how he gets the suit, I picked up on. I think I think I felt I felt very pleased that I'd picked up on things throughout the show. And I, I felt that it wasn't a difficult show to follow, and I felt that it was an enjoyable show yeah. without being kind of telegraphed for you. No, very much so. So on the whole, I, I'm, I'm going to give it two massive thumbs up and I, I, I absolutely cannot wait for season two. I think it's going to be all good things from here on in. I certainly hope so. They've certainly started it brilliantly. Uh, I would say that if I did have any gripes about it, yep. the first one would be Wilson Fisk's apartment. Yeah. One thing that's very much focused on in the comics is that Fisk lives at the top of the highest apartment building in New York because he doesn't want anybody to look down on him he wants to look down on the city and yeah. that's how he gets his control and his apartment which firstly looked very much like an office mm. was only halfway up some of the buildings that, that were right across the road from him and that was something that I thought you should have maybe followed closer to the because anybody across could have been looking out their window and seeing into his apartment which I thought was a bit well this could be something that they pick up on in season two maybe so Uh, it could be something they're building on because obviously you know you've already touched on the fact that he's not he's not actually referred to throughout the entire uh, entirety of this season as kingpin at all is he so you know I feel maybe season two is going to be he'll get that leg up and become the, the crime crime boss that we all know and love maybe so second one I would say and again without being Spoilerific, so we won't mention any names, but I felt they killed off some cracking characters whose yeah. story hadn't been told. Yeah. All of whom we've discussed. Yeah. But there were three main deaths in this that I felt I mean, certainly two of them are very much alive within the comics universe and are great ongoing supporting characters within both the Daredevil story and and, and in the Marvel universe generally. And I was surprised when each and every one of them died. Yeah. Because I wanted more from them and I wanted to see more and I wanted to experience more. You can understand the the makers of the show doing it for impact because, again, when somebody dies, you're not expecting to die. You know, you're like, wow, okay, didn't see that coming. But are they kind of 
shooting themselves in the foot yeah. in terms of playing the long game and yeah. that I would say disappointed me a little bit always leave them wanting more uh, but but then again there's no more to have uh, there's but, no more there well this is it yeah. you know you've shut the door we may want more but no, we're, I, we're getting I, more I definitely wholeheartedly agree with you on, on that they're, they're, you know the, one particular character for me who I feel should have had more of an arc won't get that arc mm. now um which we'll discuss and we'll discuss at another time when prying ears aren't listening, Graham. Uh, <laughs> these, what are all these people doing in here, anyway? <laughs> and the last thing I would say that I wasn't overly keen on, mm. and this really disappointed me, when the actual final Daredevil suit came on, I didn't like the mask. Did you not? What did no. you not like about it? Well, or can we can we not discuss this in front of? Well, uh, no, it, you know, it isn't any great spoiler. It's out there. It. It's it, it's it's um, on the web, so people can see it. And again, this is this is just a tiny little thing, but the thing about Daredevil is that his mask doesn't have eye holes. Obviously, it isn't made of sort of the armour that this is made of. It's just material. Mm. But you have sort of red circles where the eyes should be. Yeah. Whereas this, I couldn't quite make it out, but it almost seemed to have sort of black fake eyes in there. You know, you, you I think they're like a, see, a black and see, red tinted lens, I think. See the is. shape of eyes, but... I like the more classic look, which yeah. certainly Affleck had in the Daredevil movie. It was very much more like that. But also, the Daredevil mask, sort of when it comes under the nose, mm. should go straight sideways to the side of the headpiece. Okay. Whereas this sort of goes up, which almost gives it a kind of a beak kind of look, but makes his mouth look funny. It does give it a beak kind of look. Yeah. But the, the, the black mask gave it a beak kind of look as well, didn't it? Well, but that was just pulled down, therefore was just straight across. If you, I mean, have a look now. If you have a yeah. look at the front view of Daredevil's Marsh, you can see it sort of goes up slightly. And I know it's only an aesthetic thing, but I just looked at it and thought, you know, I was kind of hoping for more than that. But again, a very minor quibble in what was you a weren't, you, show. You, you weren't let down by the uh, omission of the double D on the chest? And I'm not talking about his breasts. <laughs> um, I did think about it, but again, I think that whether that's there or not, I mean, Spider-Man has the spider logo on the front to signify who he is, but I'm not sure that Daredevil, as a character in the real world, needs to have a DD for people to know who he is. If you see someone in a costume running around Hell's Kitchen beating somebody up, you don't think, who is he? Oh, it's DD on oh, his oh, chest, oh, it's fine. Daredevil. Oh, it's fine, it's Daredevil, yes. yeah. Uh, quite funny you, you mentioned Spider-Man as well because obviously Spider-Man and Daredevil very close uh, yes. friends if allies, you like, yeah. allies uh, mm-hmm. throughout the comics so obviously given the fact that you know we are going to get Spider-Man coming back into the the, the, uh, the Marvel Universe on screen be nice to see him make a little appearance, wouldn't it? If, yes. he, if he if he wants to pop in for season two, would be good. Would, would be, be good nice. but, uh, because one thing that I certainly did notice and sort of thought as I was watching it, why have they done this? Is the fact that in the comics Ben Urich works for the Daily Bugle, yeah. Of course, in this he works for the New York Bulletin. He does and, indeed. And I did wonder why they hadn't used the Daily Bugle, and so looked it up and saw that at the time of the season being made, they didn't have the rights to Spider Man and therefore the rights to the Daily Bugle. But again, a minor thing, but something as a long term. And I did notice and wonder about. On the whole, though, more hit than miss. Oh, huge. huge. Much huge. better than that old pile of shit 12 monkeys bollocks you tried to palm <laughs> I'm off I'm still me. enjoying that. Yeah. I'm still enjoying that. Well, so. that's that's one person they've got watching it then, at least. <laughs> But yes, uh, on, on, on the whole, I think we both loved it, didn't we? Absolutely. Oh, it was a fantastic show. I went into it wanting to love it. But even I was surprised at how much I did. I was blown away by how good it was. The relationships, the characterisation across the three main characters, uh, Matt, Foggy and Karen, I thought they absolutely nailed. I thought it was superb. And all the supporting cast, everybody played their part. Um, what did you think of Ben Urich? I liked him. I, I really liked him. Uh, I liked him as an actor. Uh, Vondi Curtis Hall mm. but, um very very good obviously I picked up on the fact that the character is written as a, as a white guy but yeah. for, for a character like that I don't find it being as no, much of a no, problem absolutely not because no. uh, uh, you know it's, he's, he's a newspaper reporter mm-hmm. i tell you what I did think about the show it's, I, I think I've, I read somewhere and I do wholeheartedly agree with this you can kind of compare it to The Wire it's got some comparisons to The Wire okay. the way, the, way the, se- the season runs and the way it's put together and for me the, the best thing about it is the fact that it doesn't suffer from this whole villain of the week thing no which, you know, to say that The Flash kind of suffers from that a little bit doesn't really take away from it, but it wouldn't have worked in this. No, it, I'm, it just wouldn't have I mean, worked. The thing it, would have, is... it would have taken away a lot of the, tent, uh, the tension that is created throughout these, these points that you pointed out earlier where uh, 
where where Murdoch is just completely and utterly you know ruined. Uh, yes. He physically, beaten to a pulp. Beaten to a pulp. He yes. physically cannot fight all the time. Yeah. You know, it's. Um... I mean, what this really is is a film split into thirteen fifty-minute episodes. Exactly. It, it tells a story from beginning to end exactly. and and ties it up, but leaves the door open for so much more afterwards. And that's it. It isn't thirteen individual episodes. It is a sprawling tale, you know, that just yeah. goes on and on. And yeah, love it. Can't wait for more. Good bloody stuff. And I'll tell you what, as well, Graham. Go on. Wouldn't it be nice if some of the people out there listening could tell us what they think about Daredevil? That would be good. I think they should. And how would they do that, Scott? Well, I've heard tell that we've got a Facebook page. We do. Uh, and they can also subscribe to us through uh, through iTunes, can they not? To listen to this 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 fabulous uh, cacophony of nonsense that we uh, that we keep spurting out. Churn out on a weekly churn out basis. Week. Yeah, yeah, guys. If if you are listening, please. Tell all your friends. Uh, get them to give us a listen. Please do, because uh, we we love doing this and we love you guys listening. So uh, please subscribe. Please l- have a look on the Facebook page. Please get involved. Please uh, please tell us what you think of the things that we're discussing. Please give us some ideas for things that you'd like us to discuss. This is it. I mean, we're trying to put as much up on the Facebook page rather than just the weekly listing to say that an episode's up. We want to try and develop a rapport with you guys out there who are listening. And therefore, please do jump on the Facebook page. Please do respond to the stuff we put up there. It would be great to know what you think about the stuff we say. You know, find out your opinions. But also on iTunes, if you don't subscribe, please do. But also, if you could leave us a review as well, that would be great. Because all of that stuff helps to get us a little bit further up the iTunes charts and a little bit further up the new and noteworthy list that we're currently on. And therefore, hopefully, if we can get more people seeing the podcast and hopefully listen to the podcast, you know, we can just grow the audience and make this thing bigger and better. And the fact of the matter is, listeners, the better reviews we get, the better stuff we can bring to you because uh, we're going to be allowed through the doors of some amazing places if we get, if, if they will allow us with our lovely press passes. Absolutely. Yep. So, uh, yeah, just... Uh, interact but thank you for listening but we want this to be a two-way street we want to find out not only what you guys think of us but what you guys think of the stuff we talk about and therefore please do take part we want to have a geek minded fools community rather than just us two spouting our nonsense and you guys listening in in abject silence (laughs) and misery and don't forget you know I've created an email address for you guys to contact us now you know you can you can tell us all your Star Wars uh, news here uh, uh, we're home Che- uh, Chewy, we're home. Get it right. <laughs> Chewy, we're home at hotmail.com. Please drop us a line. Uh, I think, though, no, Graham, that's it for this week, is it not? But what a bumper week it's been. But it's, I, I'm, I am worn out. Exhausted. Spent. Spent would be the word. I feel like I've gone 12 rounds with battling Jack Murdoch. Indeed, indeed, indeed. So, for this week's episode, I've been Scott. I've been Graham. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Yeah.